You're listening to Dirty Feet, a dance podcast. I'm Allison Burns. This episode of Dirty Feet once again features an Ottawa-based artist, uh, Laura Toller, who is uh, both a visual artist and has a history of being a, a dance and movement artist as well. And uh, we had the the wonderful fortune of crossing paths actually back when I was living in Montreal for a masterclass uh, that was taking place as part of the uh, Festival Transamérique over there. Um, and then she she announced that she was based in Ottawa and I went up and introduced myself and said, hey, I'm moving to Ottawa, let's talk. And the conversation has continued. And uh, right now we're going to get a chance to hear more about Laura and her artistic practice. And it's at a very appropriate time for this because she's actually um, presenting her work currently at the Gallery 101, which is here in Ottawa, 51B Young Street. And uh, it's this great gallery space. And uh, the work is... uh, Prime, well, oh my goodness, Laura, you're going to have to fill us in on the, on the work. It's primarily visual, it's photographs and uh, video as well, um, but there is a, still a movement element to this project. So, so at this point in your career, uh, you, you sound to be based more in visual arts, but with this strong kind of um, echo or connection to the movement world. Is that a fair assessment? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, I, I've always had a one of the, I've always been one of these people that has had a hard time fitting into one specific category, and um, yes, it, I think it would be fair to say that most of my work now is made more for a gallery-based setting. But I never really I, 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 things have always changed. I mean, in my early career, when I was making dance work in Toronto. Um, you know, I made work for a bar, a bar, I made work in a cemetery, I made work for the stage. And even then, I remember like my first solo show that was at the Glenn Morris Theater in, oh my God, what year was that? 1990. Um, there was a film in it. And I wish I still had that film, but I don't, I don't know where it is. I think Michael Spicer, the cinematographer, if he's kept it, still has it. You also have an extensive background working in, in dance for film, uh, your own projects, and, and working with other dance artists to, to put their work on, uh, on film or video. Is that right? I do. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> I spent many years making uh, dance films and dance documentaries, um, and I still feel like that's part of my practice, but maybe in a different way, and I, and I hope to maybe continue that in the future. It really depends. Everything's so project-based. And um, I think with this project specifically, I've really tried to take some of the things I learned as a visual artist and apply them to some of the things I know as a dance artist and as a film artist and try to sort of understand what it means mushing those things together. Um, I'm not quite sure I've figured that out, but um, I'm trying to work in a maybe a more messy way and that... um, it's a little bit freaky. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, the, I think it's not giving too much away if we talk about the, the main subject or the um, kind of maybe starting point, I don't know if it's fair to say that, of, of this work is, is kind of Tai Chi movements and, and your, um, your experience performing these Tai Chi movements on a beach and then kind of everything else comes after that. Well, funnily enough, of course, the origin is never really the origin of what you see. There's always like a story behind what you see, and the story behind what you see is in some ways more interesting, I think, Um, that this work really did not start with Tai Chi. The work started with um, an investigation of my doppelganger, which I found in a novel, in a German novel, a few years back, and it was a novel written by an artist, uh, a writer named Martin Suter, It's called uh, Die Zeit, Die Zeit, which in German means the time, the time, or time, time. And at the time, I was, um, I was actually Googling my, the photos that came up when you Googled my name. So I wanted to see what photos of my work came up. And around like the third or fourth line, there was this portrait of this 
middle-aged man. And I was like, well, that's weird. Why does this portrait of a middle-aged man come up when you Google Laura Toller? So, of course, I clicked on him and I found out he was Martin Souter and that he'd written this novel in 2012. And then the other weird thing was that on the novel, oh, sorry, and of course, <laughs> the novel starts with Laura Toller being murdered. <laughs> And then the rest of the novel is about her husband, Peter Toller, trying to figure out how to bring her back to life. So it's this, it's this sort of strange book about time. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a book about time, really, and change. And um, I didn't actually read it. I actually hired somebody to read it and to translate parts of it for me because my German is not that good. She wrote up a synopsis for me and, and um, translated some key scenes and the other strange thing about the book was that the cover of the book has a picture of, um, has a painting actually, of an artist named Peaches, who's a music artist who used to live in Berlin. I think she's in LA now. And Peaches is Meryl Nisker. And Meryl and I used to hang out together in Toronto with a whole bunch of other artists in the early 90s. Um, so, so weird. So here's Meryl or Peaches. Uh, being Laura Toller on the cover of this novel whose main character is Laura Toller. And so I just found it, I just found the whole thing kind of amusing and, amusing and strange. And um, I thought, oh, I wonder if I should sort of think about this a little bit. The, the novel also dealt with certain themes that I was curious about in terms of time and change. And so I had proposed to take this work, um, this research and development project to Berlin when I was there for a year with my family and um, to start investigating this doppelganger. And so that's really where the project started, is this investigation of a doppelganger. And you'll see in all the images, um, I perform in them, but, you know, if you know me, it's obviously not me. It's, it's a character in a way. And so that's where the project started, and it sort of took all kinds of turns. Um, and one of the original things in the proposal was that I wanted to think about what it meant to move slowly and to practice the ideas around change by moving slowly. And so I decided to take these intensive Tai Chi classes. And this was not something new. I had I had been taking Tai Chi over the years since my early 20s, but never quite found a teacher that I could stick to. And in Berlin, I just found this amazing teacher that really reminded me like how important it is to have a good teacher and what that means. And Tai Chi was the thing that um, kind of was the glue of that project in a way. So as things started falling apart around the project, um, the thing that remained was this practice of Tai Chi. And I, I, I hesitate to call it a performance because I don't think Tai Chi is supposed to be performed. I think it's really a practice. And I think the, I think about it as a practice. And um, I, was, I was so hesitant to capture it on film because, well, A, I was like a total novice. I'd only been practicing for just under a year. And I felt so reticent to um, film myself doing this thing, which was which I knew so little about in a way. I mean, people spend like their lifetime studying this art form. So, um, but I did it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> putting putting the video part of the of the exhibition aside for a moment, you took these images of of yourself in this character practicing Tai Chi, turned them into 2D stills, and then created movement within that by using repetition of the images. Can you talk a little bit about where that element came from? Absolutely. I, again, like, you know, things are so funny and serendipitous. I had been to my son's um, yearly book sale, and as I was trawling through the books, this was, again, just before we left for Berlin, I found this book from the 1970s of the I Ching and Tai Chi. And it was this photo book that had these incredible retro images of this young woman doing Tai Chi. And um, when I, I brought this book with me to Berlin and started working in my studio, I had initially intended to take some of the elements from the book and think about sort of sculptural ways of interpreting them. 
But of course I arrived in Berlin and I was like, well, I don't want to make sculptures because I'm going to have to like ship them back home. <laughs> and so I, I still took this Tai Chi book and I started, I thought, okay, let me just like photocopy these images and start thinking about them. And so I started just photocopying them in different sizes and playing with them and cutting them up. And I thought, okay, well, I'll just play with some collages. And so the I started creating these collages with this, the images from the book. But as the Tai Chi became more and more part of the project, I thought, okay, well, I'll, we'll, I'll remake these images with myself as the um, practitioner <laughs> rather than the performer, as the practitioner of these movements, and then I will recreate them. And I think the idea behind that was really, again, thinking about movement as this like whole range of, of stillnesses. Like movement is not just about moving around people think about moving like dun, dun, move 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 go 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 I, movement is just a, as much about stillness as anything else and trying to think about the relationship between stillness movement slowness and repetition uh, through these still images so this this um exhibition is called the soft and the pliable will defeat the hard and the strong yeah and it seems so uh yeah anyways <laughs> I, I understand this kind of being in, in the zone of talking about um, the combative side of, of Tai Chi or that it's a part of a practice that includes martial arts and kind of the, the, the gentle way to, to practice defeating an enemy. Is that anywhere on target? Yes, and to, to a certain extent. I mean, I think what happened with this show, which came together extremely quickly, by the way, is that I wanted to show an older piece called The Boxer, starring Bill Coleman, where he's practicing boxing. And um, I thought I wanted to push myself to take this Tai Chi work to the next place. And I thought that The Boxer with the Tai Chi work might be an interesting um, combination. So I started thinking about this idea of fighting, like like fighting, different fighting styles, and the idea that there's more than one way to fight, um, and there's more than one thing to fight for. And um, that's where the title came from, is that I started thinking about fighting and thinking about this quote, um, the soft and the pliable will defeat the hard and the strong, which is a quote by Lao Tzu from the Tao Te Ching. And it's... Um, I mean, it's funny, when I learned Tai Chi, there's, there's a thing called push hands. Oh, I feel so uncomfortable talking about Tai Chi because I am so, I'm such a novice and I really feel uncomfortable talking about it. Do you think that the people that are really into Tai Chi are going to feel badly? I feel like they'll be very at peace and very <laughs> welcoming that you are interested in the universe of Tai Chi. I guess. I just, I just... I guess I've always had a reticence about talking about things that I don't know enough about. And that's one of my probably weaknesses is that I'm so reticent to do anything if I don't feel like I'm not an expert, but at least have like researched and investigated it enough to know about whatever it is I'm talking about. And even though I have been practicing Tai Chi for almost three years now, a good part of that has been on my own because I haven't found the teacher that i want to learn with here so um so for me the piece is less about tai chi and it's more about practicing movement practicing something that that um thinking about the relationship between movement stillness and change um and the title is sort of reflects that change doesn't like fighting for change is not necessarily something that's done in one way. Like when we think about the idea of fight, I think often I think about something violent when I think about fight, but I, but I think when I, when I think about fighting for something, I think that, you know, fighting is really the desire to produce change. When you're fighting for something, you want to produce a change, but, and there's lots of different ways to produce change. Sometimes producing change is just about standing still. Let's zoom out a little bit from the, this particular exhibition and talk about um, this, this delicious world you live in between visual arts and dance. I think, especially in contemporary dance, there's a lot of people that combine those skills in their practice. Um, do you find yourself approaching either universe 
with, uh, with something particular, um, I, I, I guess what I'm asking is, do you, do you see yourself at exhibitions talking about work differently than somebody else, having this dance background and vice versa? That's an interesting question. <laughs> um, sometimes, sometimes, I mean, sometimes I see exhibitions that have sort of performance, dance, works in them, and um, my perspective might be different because I come from the dance world and I've seen so many things on the stage and I, I, I have a, I feel like I can speak in an expertly way about dance vocabulary and um, performance styles and uh, yeah, all, all those kinds of things. Um, and often a visual art audience doesn't have so much of that knowledge. Some of them do, like I have a lot of colleagues who have a really strong knowledge or who also have ba dance backgrounds. Um, my friend Emma from Berlin, who also, she was she studied at the Canadian Children's Dance Theater and she, did, she actually did a lot of martial arts too and she's a visual artist and we have a really interesting um, dialogues around those things. I bet. Yeah, and she, I, yeah, I remember actually the performance I'm thinking of, she was there in Montreal, I ran into her, and we were watching this dance performance in a museum together and um, and talking about it. And we had a really nice, co interesting conversation because we have a lot of similar um, touch points. So sometimes I approach certain works differently. It really depends. But also, like, I'm, I mean, I've only been inside the visual artwork for, I don't know, 10 years or so, so that's not a very long time considering. But then I also have a really hard time with this idea of like, well, the visual art world and the film world and the dance world and, and you know, what does it mean to be an artist and how, how readily do your um, skills and thoughts and ideas and, and ways to interpret work translate from one to the other. And I think depending on the kind of artist you are, those can translate quite readily. Um, uh, I feel like there's there's a real fluidity with the way I move between those worlds. And I want to talk for a moment about um, the world of live performance for you. And uh, I've been, you know, in the master class and in different contexts, able to kind of witness you and your stage presence. And uh, oh boy, and it's it's bold and it's uh, very carefree and it's very open and vulnerable and. Um, uh, you're, you're just very comfortable, um, as a, as a performer. And I'm wondering, um, have you always been that way? Probably. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, you change over the years. I mean, I think I'm not a young person anymore. And I think, I mean, I'm not in my twenties, nor am I in my thirties. Um, and, uh, I, I feel like, you know, you go through certain life experiences and, you just don't have that much pride or shame anymore. <laughs> and I feel like I'm a little bit there, although I probably have like, there's probably a lot more vanity than I would like to admit. So I, I feel as though every time I'm about to perform, there's, there's always a heartbeat where it's like, maybe I just won't. Maybe I'll just go home. Maybe, maybe we don't need to do this. Um, and there's that fear and then and then it goes ahead and it's fine it's great and it's wonderful but it, every single time it seems that there's that little moment do you ever experience that well I sort of feel a little bit like that right now when I turned that video on behind you and I was like oh maybe I don't need to do this <laughs> <laughs> we'll just tell everybody to go home that's right don't worry about it uh let's talk about uh this this dance video that you you showed me a while back um, that was targeted towards potential dance audiences. Uh, it had a great title too. What is it? A very dangerous pastime. That's right. A Can very you, dangerous pastime. And then the subtitle was a devastatingly simple dance guide. And uh, I love that you brought this to my attention because you know we were having a conversation about about just that fear fear of dance. Um, and, and you showed me that it wasn't anything new. So can you give us a bit of a context around the era when you created that um, film and what inspired its creation? Well, that's funny. It was a while ago. So we're in 2017 now, and that film, we made it in 1999. And I, I can't remember if we finished it just in 99 or 2000, probably 2000, so 17 years ago. Um, and probably could have made that film any time in the last 60, 70 years. I mean, 
you know, give or take some of the footage that was more contemporary in it. But um, that film was actually commissioned by the Canada Dance Festival. I think the, um, if I remember correctly, the board of directors of the Canada Dance Festival were sitting around thinking, like, what can we do to encourage some audience development? Uh, you know, can we can we create some audience development tools to, you know, tell people that, you know, dance is not that scary. It's, it's you know, you can go to dance and there's all kinds of things you can appreciate and love about it, even if you don't completely understand everything you're seeing. And uh, so Kathy Levy approached me, um, who Kathy was running the Canada Dance Festival at the time, and she approached me about making this video. And so, yeah, off we went and I wrote a script. And um, it was kind of funny because it was made in a documentary style and I wrote a script, but then I went out and interviewed all these people. So part of my job was to try and get some of the answers that I'd written out of them, which was a lot easier than I than I thought. Um, and yeah, it's really just a 15-minute film video about um, how to look at contemporary dance, and it you know could apply to a lot of different art forms as well. And the funniest thing was that um, recently I was at the Harborfront Centre in Toronto, and I picked up this little pamphlet that Cara Spooner had written for um for harbor front she was commissioned to do it and um it's basically like a very dangerous pastime in pamphlet form hmm. it was hilarious it had it was very similar questions very similar answers and issues and it was really nice i i got to meet cara um um a couple of years ago and mentioned we, we had a chat about it so so you know she had done something very similar but in a different format you know 15 years after showing that Unfortunately, the need for these kinds of tools are still, um, you know, this, these tools are still relevant and necessary. If you if you had just thirty seconds to to explain to someone why dance is amazing and not intimidating, what would you say? <gasps> like con- condense that film into a brief moment. Your elevator pitch before they get off on the next floor. Oh my God! I'm totally like I, I just want to mime it. <laughs> <laughs> Show it through dance. Yeah, I just want to like, like I feel like my facial expression would just go big and I would do some jazz hands and, and, and big movements and gestures and just show how like how exciting it is to see somebody express themselves through movement and mm-hmm. facial expression and gesture and that you get so much from that, from the like two bodies kind of face to face and one body doing things and the other body looking and trying to absorb um, I think understand is a really complicated word, so probably not understand, but try to absorb and appreciate and enjoy what the other body's doing. Awesome. Can we can we back up to uh, your experience with Le Group? Oh uh, my God, we can back up a lot for as that. A choreographer, right? Twenty two years. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, uh, everyone I speak to in Ottawa, we mourn the the disappearance of the company. But uh, let us let us know uh, what that was like for you coming in and, and working with them. Well, my first um, encounter with Le Group was actually in the early '90s when Peter Bonham organized uh, Peter Bonham and um, Bob Lockyer from the BBC in England and the Banff Centre organized a workshop in Banff called Dance in the Camera. And I, I was like 20 or 21, and I had seen all these amazing dance films at the Canada Dance Festival here in Ottawa um, that Kathy Levy and Lisa Cochran had organized. And I was really, really smitten by these dance films. And I, and I saw there was this workshop in Banff, and I thought, oh, I really want to take that. So they were accepting, I think it was five choreographers, five filmmakers, and five composers, and they were going to be working with the group De La Place Royale Company to, for on a, during a three-week kind of intensive workshop to create little dance film segments, exercises. And I, um, so I applied, um, and I think, I can't remember if I applied late or whatever. I applied, and but I was super young. I mean, I was 21. I had very little experience. And um, so I thought, okay, I'm going to, humor I'm going to try and humor my way into this and I don't know if I still have the letter I wrote to Peter Bonham but I wrote him this like super silly letter and I think I drew him a picture of like a did a little storyboard or something of me like waiting by the phone for his phone call (laughs) and anyways to make a long long story short I got in I got into this workshop and uh by the skin of my teeth I think and um 
ended up in Banff with Le Groupe de la Place Royale and all these um, great film directors and other choreographers and composers. And it was like a grueling three weeks, really, really hard. I went in there thinking that I might want to direct. I went in as a choreographer and I left knowing I wanted to direct. And shortly after, I started making my first film and then spent the next 15 years, 15 to 20 years making films with dance and movement. So that was an important experience. Oh, it was so, yeah, it was really, really important. And then I came, and then Peter invited me back to the Le group in 95 to work with the company on a piece, um, which was great. I mean, I have so many, I have such vivid memories of being here working with them. And then that piece um, was further developed in Toronto into the last piece I actually created for a live audience, like a last larger dance piece, and it was called Sick Farm, which many people thought was an unfortunate title, but I stick to it, stick by it. And it was um, in a very large warehouse space in Toronto. Um, we created this special type of seating, on, and uh, it, it was a really interesting project. And um, it was a strange project, but a really interesting project. And there's still people who see me and say, oh, my God, I remember that piece. I loved it. And then other people were like, mm, not so sure. <laughs> But, but, I mean, the thing about Le Group is, like, I still have friends, you know, who I made as dancers there. And um, and I have so many memories of Ottawa. I mean, for me, with dance, Ottawa was, was really about the Canada Dance Festival and Le Group de la Place Royale. Those two things that I came here for. Now, you've mentioned watching dance films. And uh, there there are a ton of them out there. And you have clips of them in A Dangerous Pastime. Uh, do you have a recommended resource for how to how to see good dance films, like on the internet or at the library? What's your go-to method? That is such a good question. It's really hard to figure that out. And especially now, I mean, I've been sort of out of dance film for the last 10 years, and there's so many new dance films and amazing films that have been created. I mean, the best way to see dance films is to go to a dance film festival. Then you'll see only recent ones, usually. Um it's really hard. There isn't like a good distribution network. There was a guy in the States, Mark, what's Mark's last name? Oh my God. Mark, he, he has a, he had a channel called Tondu TV. And then he was starting some kind of like a Netflix arts dance channel, which I'm not sure where it's at um, right now. But he sort of had, he was sort of the, one of the only people in the world who was trying to distribute dance films over the internet so that you could actually watch them. Uh, but again, like his selection was, you know, your, the dance film audience, the sort of larger dance film audience tends to be more, still more like ballet opera type thing. And so um, there's a lot of um, more classical work and there is experimental work as well. But um, I'm not so sure where you would find that. There are great festivals, but, you know, they don't have, they don't stream the films. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've noticed that the library has a limited selection. Um, I know in Montreal there is a dance library that's run out of... Um, uh, Fancy les... Moore? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, les Ballets Contemporains de Montréal, I think. I think it's so. A school in, in the Plateau area, and they have a lot of dance films there that you can rent. I don't know if the same is true in Ottawa, if they have any such thing. No, I think it's really like it ends up being private collections that sometimes get... Um, you know, grouped into libraries. But um, I don't know if there's a good online resource of actual films. Okay. Well, we'll keep, we'll keep a lookout for Mark and his, uh, and his Netflix-esque uh, resource. I'm all out of questions. I've, I've been speaking with Laura Toller. Um, and Laura, before I do go, I do want you to give us your proper pronunciation of your name. Everyone's going to know you as Laura Toller. But it's just so beautiful. Can you oh tell boy. us again? Well, I come from Romania, and in Romanian, you would pronounce my name, Laura Taler. Lovely. And my last question is, do you have anything left to say that you want the world to know about you and your creative process? No, I really enjoyed speaking with you, and um, I hope people come and check out the show. I'm still working out what, what's happening here, and, um, but it opens March 4th. From two to five, it's a, it'll be a kid-friendly opening because it's in the afternoon. And that's all I have to say. Perfect. And it runs all the way until April 1st. And we're, of course, in 2017. And the gallery is open from Tuesday to Saturday. 
from I, 10 to 5. I do have something to add. There is, we're having a couple of special events on March 11th from 11 to 4 is the Art and Feminist Edit-a-thon. And that's when um, there's a group of people around the world who are trying to add um, female personalities and people onto the Wikipedia because largely the the entries are made by men uh, and they're largely male entries. And so there's a group of people around the world and um, I think it's International Women's Day on March 11th. Usually they have a big art and feminism edit-a-thon on that day, so we're going to host it at Gallery 101 on March 11th. As well, on Saturday, April 1st, from 2 to 4 p.m., there's going to be an artist roundtable, so I'll be here speaking and answering questions and discussing things with whoever else is here. So that's brilliant. So if you've been listening to the podcast and just screaming at me to ask Laura something in particular, you could actually just come and ask her yourself. Absolutely. And again, the name of the show is The Soft and the Pliable Will Defeat the Hard and the Strong. And it's hosted here by Gallery 101, 51B Young Street. So thank you so much, Laura, and uh, enjoy the exhibition. Thank you, Allison. You've been listening to Dirty Feet. I'm Alison Burns with a few thank yous. First to Paula Flalo and the No More Radio Network. Also to Mainline Theatre and Montreal Improv Theatre. And to all present and past team members who can be found on our website, dirtyfeetpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook at Dirty Feet Podcast and follow us on Twitter at Dirty Dirty Feet. Thank you for listening. Until next time. Stick around for a preview of our upcoming episode. This week I have a return guest. I'm going to be speaking again with Sylvie Dorossier. So then I went to, okay, just movement and we see what the movement will tell us and then I would follow what the movement would tell me which in fact is my own story you know and so I think then from there I kind of find my way back into being able to talk about events without saying too much of a story because I want the piece to have more of um, fluid expression and a way for people to come in with their own experiences. As if the story's too rigid, then there's no way in, you know? Mm